Hello, Heritage Baptist Church. It's good to be in God's house this Sunday evening. And uh, we are studying the ABCs of Christian growth and looking forward to the message that God has for us today. Uh, just a few things. Uh, one, uh, continue praying for Brother Tom and his safe recovery. I'll also be praying for Brother Tim uh, and his kidneys and Miss Mary. And uh, what a blessing uh, that is to be able to lift up each other in prayer. And uh, so that's a, that's a huge blessing. Uh, I did promise you a, a verse tonight, and so I have your verse, so get a pen and paper ready as we look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 and 28. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 and 28. Uh, and uh, if you have that in your Bibles, you can open up your the Word of God, and we will do this verse together. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 and 28. I'll give you a couple seconds to get there. And uh, again, uh, we want to pick up our Bible verses again and start studying. And this is, a, I want to kind of ease into it. It's a new verse to a lot of folks, but uh, some uh, in boot camp, we, I believe, uh, oh, about three years ago, four years ago, we did this verse. Uh, but uh, it's a good verse in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. God's word says, neither, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may give to him that needeth. And what a wonderful uh, verse for us to commit to memory. And so I want to encourage you to start studying that. We'll be working on that uh, for the next couple of Sundays, and then we'll move on uh, to our next verse. Uh, but I believe that's a good verse to start uh, back up with. And again, that's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 and 28. All right, we've been studying the ABCs of Christian growth and excited about uh, getting back in that. We left off with the question, what is God? There are four statements in the Bible telling us what God is. And uh, this is a bit of review. Uh, one, we learned that God is a spirit, his divine essence. We learned God is love, his divine compassion. We learned God is light, his divine holiness. And we learned that God is a consuming fire, his design divine righteousness and in hebrews chapter 12 verse 29 says that for our god is a consuming fire so we're going to pick up in there and we're going to look a little bit about god's personality why is it important for us to look at god's personality well uh, i believe that we don't have an understanding of really who or what God is, but we have the attributes of God and we have his personality that's given us, given to us in the word of God. And we see here some things that we have uh, about God's personality. Uh, the first one is God's love. And, and I believe God has a, a great love for us. In John chapter 3, verse 16, a verse that we know, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved us so much, he gave us his son. Uh, and that's a, there, that defines any love that anyone could have. God gave the most precious thing that he had, and that was his son. And uh, knowing that should uh, alone change our lives. But when we, get ex when we call upon the name of the Lord and get saved, uh, we see that that inward change happens. Why? Because of God's love. Then we see that God hates. And turn to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 16. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. Give you some time to get there. God hates, and he has the ability to hate. And in the word of God, it tells us this. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, it says, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are abomination unto him. And uh, boy, that's a message into itself, but the personality of God or, or the ability for God to hate is there. Uh, uh, where do you think the Bible gets the uh, uh, be ye angry and sin not? What is the sin not? It's a righteous anger. Uh, what is a righteous anger? It's standing up for the things that are God, for God. I believe Christ had a righteous anger when he chased the money changers out of the temple. That was a righteous anger. Uh, we see that 
that uh, God also grieves and, and and how sad that we can uh, that our actions can grieve God. Uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter six, verse number six, Genesis chapter six, verse number six. God's word says, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Isn't it so sad that we can grieve God? We can grieve God who is great. We can grieve God who created all things. And we can make him to where he repented in, 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 in creating us. What was the thing that was driving God crazy during this time? Was it because we weren't worshiping him enough? No. It was because of our sin and, and, and how uh, unrestrained our sin became and, and, and that sin and that, uh, that uh, worshiping false idols and all those things causes God to grieve. The Bible says that we can often grieve the Holy Spirit more on a personal note that uh, when you do things that are contrary to the word of God, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. How serious is that to grieve the Holy Spirit? And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. I think the reason they can't, they include that last part uh, in his heart or at his heart, I believe is to show how much he grieves for that, that sin that caused God is jealous. We see, we know this, God says, for I am a jealous God. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16, turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number, uh, I'm sorry, 15, not 16. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 15. God's word says, for the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from the face of the earth. Why would God be jealous? Because uh, we understand when God gave the Ten Commandments, he said, you sh thou shalt have not have any other gods before me. Uh, there is no other gods. There's one God. And, and that God that we have is, is a God that, only that not only loves and hates and grieves, but is a jealous God and wants to be number one in your life. Today we can still grieve God, but we can also make God jealous by worshiping things before him. We also see in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 9, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse number 9, that God can be angry. In 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 9, uh, God's word says, And the Lord was angry with Solomon. Because his heart was turned from the Lord uh, of God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Now, God had bestowed uh, all the, all the uh, wisdom of Solomon, but with all God, uh, the wisdom of Solomon, he still grieved the Lord. He still made God angry by his actions. Why? Because we know at this time that uh, Solomon actually had other uh, uh, concubines and wives. Boy, he had a lot of them. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and he brought in all these things, these outside things, and, and he turned his heart. Now, Solomon turned his heart away from God and sought after these things that he brought in, these false images, these false gods. And, and, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Solomon. And, and Solomon, uh, I believe, uh, as being as intelligent as he was, boy, uh, did he struggle in the area of this and not seeing that he made God angry. And, and it, it even says, which had appeared unto him twice, God had appeared upon unto Solomon and, and he shouldn't have any doubt that he is the God is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and and yet yet he he angered the Lord by his actions the last one perhaps one of the most important ones is in first Peter chapter 5 verse number 7 first Peter chapter 5 verse number 7. We see that not only can God love and not only does he hate and not only can he grieve and not only is he jealous and not only can he be angry, but God cares. This is demonstrated by his love towards us. God cares. 
First Peter chapter five, verse number seven. First Peter chapter five, verse number seven. A familiar verse here that we see and we understand that uh, we hear this all the time. But listen, uh, God cares about you. He cares about if you go to the left. He cares about if you go to the right. He cares about what job you're doing. He cares about what you're doing in your free time. He cares about when you place place other things before him. He cares about all those things, but he cares about you and he desires for you to live the life of a Christian that's supposed to live and lift him up and glorify him with all your actions and worship him. God cares. First Peter chapter five, verse number seven says, casting all your cares upon him for he careth for you. God cares for you and he, he loves you. He, 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 he doesn't want to see you fall into sin. He cares about what you do. He wants to be a part of your life and you can cast your burdens upon him. You can cast your trials upon him and you can find that he careth for you because he takes that yoke upon his shoulders. These are all characteristics of personality there are some who think God is just impersonal force that is just uh, uh, or or that he, he is just nature. He is much more complex than that. Non-believers typically choose to accept only the nice characteristics of God and the 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 God that uh, has to deal with judgment and the God that can't deal with sin. Uh, they like to they like to just look away from that stuff and just think, well, God is just love. But they don't know that God has to have judgment against sin. We see here in, in this subtitle that, that when we define what is God, we have to define his love. We have to define his hates. We have to define what grieves him. We have to find what, define what uh, je makes him jealous. We have to define what makes him angry. And we have to know that he cares for us. What is God like is our next part. If we look at God's creation, we know him to be mighty, glorious, majestic. But it's through the Bible that, that reveals him completely. No man will be able to ever comprehend the essence of God or, or what he is. It is only through God's attributes that, that he makes himself known to us, uh, to a finite man. So I want to look at a few things here that uh, can maybe help us with the Lord. Number one, God is all knowing. God knows everything. He knows the past. He knows the future. And you say, I don't understand because don't we say that nothing is predestined. And, and for us to understand, if we know the future, we don't think we can change it. But listen, God knows, and I love this part, God knows the future and the past and he gives us free will. And God knows if, if we're going to go to the left or go to the right, God knows both directions that we may choose. God gives us that ability to do that. But God is all-knowing. We see five things God knows about you. Uh, turn to Psalms 139, verse number 14. God is all-knowing. Psalms 139, verse number 14. God's word says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Now listen, God knows us. He knows, the Bible says, the intent of our heart. He knows everything about us. And God searches us and he knows us. It says, thou knowest my down settings and knowest my uprisings. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my path uh, and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For some of us, we say that's probably mighty. That's uh, God's power. But for some others of us, we don't want him to know all our ways. Why? Because not always are our ways godly. 
For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. God knows everything. He knows what we think. He knows what we do. He knows how we do it. And he knows what we, uh, when we're going to do it. He knows about all that stuff. He knows our heart. He knows our, our down settings. He knows our uprising. He knows our thoughts. He know, he's acquainted with everything we do. Nothing surprises God. I can't think of anybody that would sit up, sit out here and say, hmm, I think I'll surprise God with something random today. He knows all our ways. He knows every word in our mouth. Pretty scary. And here's one other thing that we need to make sure we understand. God knows our heart. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 20. Turn there. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 20. 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. God's word says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. The Bible tells us he doesn't only know our heart, but listen, he knows the intent of our heart. He knows it before we are going to do it. But listen, uh, some things we can hide. We can hide our actions. Amen. We can come to church and pretend to be the best godly person around. We can hide our actions. Some of us are, are able to hide our attitudes and, our, and, and how we really feel. And, and, and even though we're irritated with somebody, we can put a smile on our face and, and, and smile at them and talk with them. And, and, and we can hide those things. Some of us can hide lying. Some of us can hide whatever it is. But do you understand today that you cannot hide from God? God knows your heart. He knows every bit of everything about you. And you cannot hide your sin from God. You cannot hide lies from God. You cannot hide uh, the, how you truly feel from God. You cannot hide those things. That's why the Bible says we must submit to the Lord. We can't hide from God. He knows those things. God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. This is important for us to understand because, listen, as the radios say, the good old boy upstairs, and they seem to strip God of all this power and strip God from everything. Listen, God is all-powerful. He is the God. He created the, the heavens and the earth. He created everything seen on the earth. He created man. He created the trees. He created everything. God is all-powerful. God can do anything. Job chapter 42, verse number two. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it. He says, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. See, listen, Job understood who God was. Job understood what God was. And he understood nothing could be hidden from him. God can do anything. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Turn there with me. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. God's word says, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All things are possible. Nothing is none possible for God. Matthew understood it. Job understood it. Why doesn't the world today understand that God is a powerful God and God created all things and we should put our trust and faith in God and not withhold anything from him? The next thing is God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. God is in everything. He's everywhere. You can't hide from him. You can go to your, your closet. God is there. You can hide in your office. God is there. You can run to your bedroom. God is there. You can hide from the world. You can hide from those things. But listen, you cannot hide from God because God is everywhere. Turn with me to Psalms 139, 
verse 7 through 17. Psalms 139, verse 7 through 17. We see the, here that the, the verses are going to tell us about God's ability to be omnipresent. That simply means everywhere, at the same time, everywhere. It's not like Satan. Satan is a created being. He can't be everywhere. He can't be omnipresent. He is not God. He is created, but God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. You cannot hide from God. In Psalms 139, verse 7 through 17, let's read that to this evening. It says, Whether shall I go from my, thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. Amen. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall uh, cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me with my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance had not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did not see my substance, uh, yet being unperfect and in in thy book all my members were written, which is continuance, uh, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there is none of them. How precious also are their thoughts unto, are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! Now look back with me, and it says in verse uh, thirteen of Psalms one hundred ninety-seven, verse or one hundred and thirty. 9 verse 7 it says it says in verse 13 thou hast possessed my reins thou hast covered me in my mother's womb even before we were they we were born God was there God is everywhere God you cannot hide from God God is everywhere he's omnipresent <coughs> look at verse 12 it says yea the darkness hideth not from thee but night shineth as to the day, <coughs> can I tell you tonight, not only can you not hide from God, but can I tell you that, that uh, day and night, you know, the Bible says men love darkness rather than light. Sin happens at night. If you doubt that, uh, go with the police department. All the crimes happen, it seems like, 2.30 in the morning. Why? Because man loves darkness. But listen, with God, it's no different. Darkness and daylight are the same to God. The next attribute is God is eternal. God has no beginning. God has no end. God is eternal. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. It says here, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. I'm going to move back because I'm a little blurry, I just noticed. I am that I am. And he said, thus shall, say, uh, shall thy, thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Jesus Christ is eternal. The Holy Spirit is eternal. And God the Father is eternal. There was no beginning. There is no end. And he is the great I am. There's no question to that. Psalms 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were wrought forth, or even thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from the everlasting to the everlasting, thou art God. This verse tells us that God extends from everlasting to everlasting. He's always been here. God is eternal. 
The next point is God is unchanging. He's immutable. Turn with me to Malachi chapter 3, verse number 6. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 6. We see in this verse, it says God does not change. In verse 6, it says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God does not change. He doesn't change for generation and generation. I think it's ridiculous to say this is modern religion. We should change to modernize the religion and make it fit today's society. That's wrong, and I don't think we should do it. God doesn't change. Therefore, what we preach and what we teach should not change. Amen? If God doesn't change, why, why should we change in what we believe? Now, we should change. I like what we have. Come as you are. Prepare to change. We should change spiritually, but we should morph into the Word of God. That's the change that's talking about. But God does not change, and neither does His Word. Then we see here that not only is God immutable, but God is holy. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 99, verse number 9. Psalms 99, verse number 9. God's word says, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Can you understand this, this, this evening that God is holy, that God is, is not only eternal, but he is holy? Then it's something that we can recap again is God is love. He proves his love by having Christ die for our sins. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse number 8. Sound familiar? Romans chapter 5, verse number 8. We can say it together, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, how wonderful that is because we were in our sinful state and Jesus Christ died for us. Moving on, we can see God is gracious. I'm thankful for the grace that God has for us. Grace simply means undeserved merit, undeserved favor. Undeserved favor. We can apply this to God's undeserved favor, riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's really how grace is spelled out. God's riches at Christ's expense. We are saved by grace. Someone give me an amen. We are saved by grace. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8. The Bible says here, For by grace ye are saved uh, through faith and not uh, of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Understanding that we are saved by grace. We did not deserve it. We are saved by grace. Uh, listen, uh, God could easily have said just, you know, I'm just going to start over. He didn't. He gave us a plan to get saved. We're saved by grace. We can see that we're also taught by grace. Turn to Titus chapter 2, verse, 12, uh, verse 11. We'll read 11 and 12. Titus chapter 2, uh, verse 11 and 12. And God's word says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation shall appear to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodly and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, when you have someone say, Oh, God doesn't care how we live. I can be just what I am, and, and, and I don't have to change for God. That's not what that verse is saying. That verse is saying here that he's teaching us to deny ungodliness, teaching us to deny worldliness, teaching us to, uh, to deny lust of this world, teaching us that we should live soberly, that we should live uh, righteously and godly in this present world. Then we see we are kept by grace. Not only are we saved by grace, not only are we taught by grace, but we are also kept by grace. 
Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. God's word says here, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in thy weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Who's saying this? It's the Apostle Paul saying this. And he's saying, my grace, he had this thorn in the flesh and he gave it to God and he prayed thrice and he gave it to God and all that stuff. And God said, no, I'm not going to take that away from you. And he says, uh, because of that, he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Boy, that was Paul's life, and that's how he was. He, he was kept by grace. He was kept to walking the way he should be walking, and it was made perfect through Jesus Christ. The last part that we have this evening is God is truth. Titus chapter 1, verse 2, turn there with me. We find out that there are some act of, attributes of God. God cannot lie. God cannot lie, he is true. In Titus chapter 1, verse number 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Our God has not the ability to lie. He cannot lie in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised. Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 8, The grass withereth, the flowers fadeth, but, of, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Like that song, my word shall stand. Listen, God's word shall stand forever. It won't become unpopular. It won't become outdated. The only way it comes unpopular is those, those that refuse to adhe adhere to it. God's word shall stand. God's word is true. You know, there's some challenges that I got from this message from, that God had us for today. In divining who God is, we look, we can see that we fall short of what God expects. Do we give up? No, we don't give up. We just keep trying. Trying to live for God, trying to live for Christ. Listen, I don't know how God's talked to your heart, but we're gonna have a short time of invitation. If God's talked to your heart, won't you spend some time with him? Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the day that you've given us. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come together this evening. Challenge us, Lord, with your word. Lord, challenge us with everything you've taught us. And Lord, we love you so much. We just want to serve you with every inch we have in us. Bring us together soon, Lord. We pray that the FM receiver will get here soon. And Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as the piano player begins to play, if God's talked to your heart, won't you spend some time with him? Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you, we ask you, Lord, to guide our thoughts and direct our ways. 
Lord, we thank you for everything you've done for us. Lord, we thank you for Heritage Baptist Church even holding together. And Lord, we pray that you bring us together soon. Lord, allow this, this scripture to talk to our hearts tonight. We love you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Heritage Baptist Church, it's good to have you with us again tonight. And uh, study your verses. Uh, make sure that you keep praying one for another. And uh, listen, uh, we need to pray for each other. We need to study God's word. And we need to grow in Christ. And the last part is support your church. God bless you and have a good week.